I'm Cameron DeVazier. And I'm Mark Howard. And this is Talking Points. We are now in the second lesson of our first quarter of this new year. Isaiah is the book of the Bible we're focusing in on. And we've already had a fantastic study last week, and this week looks to be no different. In fact, uh, uh, and very important themes are brought out uh, that we would do well to heed, I yeah, would absolutely. imagine, in our day. So, Mark, why don't you, uh, well, why don't you start us off with a word of prayer sure. and then give us the, the uh, bird's eye view of where we're headed this week. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for your word and the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, to give us understanding in spiritual things. We do pray for the Spirit's guidance today as we study this lesson. We pray, Lord, you'd help us to make a practical application on our lives that would help us to uh, become more closely committed to you and to the work that you've given us to do. We ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. So well, these are obviously, we're kind of chronologically going through here, so it gives us a little, gives us a little context here. Where are we well, in the pace of things? Chronologically is a little bit loose, just from a standpoint of we started last week in Isaiah 1 and we're in Isaiah 6 this week, and we'll backtrack okay. a little bit. There's a reason that, that I believe that Dr. Gain jumped to Isaiah 6, because this is so really, uh, it's, a, it's a, a foundational piece it's of Isaiah's ministry. It's kind Isaiah's of a thematic ministry. beginning of the whole thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah and, it's, and of course it talks about a crisis of leadership. It, it was a, a crisis in the history of Israel during or shortly after the death of Isaiah, King Isaiah. We talked about how the uh, Isaiah's ministry spanned the reigns of Isaiah, his son Jotham, and then Ahaz, and then Hezekiah. Mm. And so this, the first of those kings was didn't reign very long in Isaiah's ministry before he passed off the scene. Mm. And Isaiah was a faithful king for much of his ministry and a very loved king in Israel. And then toward the end of his reign, he actually had tried to offer incense in the temple or to to take mm -hmm. the role of a priest and was stricken with leprosy for the remainder of his life. So, yes. I mean, you know, when you have confidence in a leader, especially when a leader is a good leader, that can be a little bit of a shakeup. And then we talked about yeah. the times that Israel was going through where you had the rise of the Assyrian power. And so all of this stuff is going on. Yeah. And uh, it was at this time that King Isaiah dies. So it launches Israel into this crisis of leadership. Obviously, you know, when you have a, it's different when you have, a, for example, even in the Adventist Church or in the uh, United States, you have, I could say, yeah. elections don't you, always go exactly. smoothly. Why don't you possible. dive into politics? But real quick, the yeah. idea is that, you know, it's different when a leader, there's a process to get a new leader. Mm. Uh, that's different than when a leader dies. And suddenly right. you're like, hey, where are we going to get a leader from? So they're right. in this situation like our leader died and we've got, of course, you know, you have the sons and people of the, of the tribe of Judah, those of that lineage that have replaced. It's not, you know, there's a little bit of a process, but, mm -hmm. but clearly, there was a crisis of leadership. Well, plus uh, there's a crisis of leadership and there's the external pressures going on out in the world yes. around them, right? So there's a, it's not just any old change of leadership. There right. is a particular pressure right now to, to look to someone. We got to, there, there was, a, there, there, there was some trouble there, right? Yes. Anyway, so this is the setting that we find ourselves in and we're looking at that death of Isaiah and the immediate uh, effect of that on, on the nation of Judah. So uh, Israel and Judah. And so our three talking points are number one, don't put your trust in princes. And that's drawing the language of the Psalms. We'll see mm -hmm. that in a moment. And that's drawing also from Sabbath and Sunday's lesson. And then key point number, talking point number two is God's glory is our motivation for mission. Oh, that's and interesting, we, yeah. We see this taking place actually in the ministry of Isaiah. And um, <laughs> you talk about Isaiah and Isaiah, and you, and you say, <laughs> He's like, which one are we talking about? about? Yeah. And that, I think, uh, spans Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday's lesson. And then finally, our last talking point is that grieving the Spirit is our choice, not God's choice. Mm. We talk a little bit about grieving the Holy Spirit, the unpardonable sin. And, and I think, because we've been doing this for a little while with our uh, Sabbath school programs, but sometimes I think of the fact that, well, we covered this before. We talked about the grieving of the Spirit, or we talked about this, or we talked about that, and I forget. And I think I'm bringing this up for the sake of uh, the teachers of the lessons, that um, there will be things, you know, we're in a new quarterly, but it's written by 
or 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 the the contributor is a different person. Mm -hmm. So you may have the point same point made again, but keep this in mind. You may have different people in your Sabbath school every week too who need to hear a lesson. So sometimes well, we're tempted to think, well, we covered that like uh, well, you know. Two but how many ago. times do you go to like, oh, I heard the one about Jesus already. Yeah. I've covered it. Like there are exhaustless right. themes that could repetition is learning right. and that deepens the impression. So this is these are important things to talk about. So that third point is about uh, grieving the spirit, the unpardonable sin, and it's our choice, not God's. God doesn't choose to take the spirit away as much as we choose to have Him taken away. Okay. So well, let's go back to the first one then. Don't put your trust in princes. Now yes. that, that's a little bit, to me, that strikes me as, I mean, obviously we know that language from the Psalms, but like, and isn't I that the that purpose the of note. princes is to be the trusted person, right? Isn't that their whole point Well, Psalm 146 verse 3, which is in our notes here, says, don't put your trust in princes nor in a son of man in whom there is no help. Mm. And, and you make a good point. Well, princes are established to, to you know, leaders are there to trust. But I believe the point the Bible's trying to get at is, especially from a Christian perspective, a good leader is only the front man for the true leader. Mm. In other words, I've had the role of a lead. We're leaders right now in the conference office. God forbid people be looking to me or to mm -hmm. you. We look to God and we want other people to look to God. And when we teach, we want them to look to God. So I think the lesson is trying to say, and I think the case with Isaiah and other kings of Israel, mm -hmm. I think the case with leaders today in our church or in the world, uh, there are cases where people will look to the person instead of looking to God. Mm. Uh, ancient Israel, well, Moses, why do you lead us out into the wilderness? Yeah, Moses is the one who brought yeah. the cloud and the pillar of fire and opened the sea. And in fact, that's what got Moses in trouble. <laughs> Must we bring water from this rock? Right. It's like, well, you brought the glory to yourself, right? That's the problem. So anyway, so there's this idea of don't put your trust in princes and they had apparently become so confident or comfortable with their earthly leadership that they had lost sight of their heavenly sovereign. That's right. And uh, in just a little bit, the, the lesson gives a little bit of the setting. I'm just jumping okay. to point number four on Sunday's lesson at the bottom of the page. It says, The death of Isaiah in about 740 B.C. marks a major crisis in the leadership of God's people. The death of any absolute ruler makes his or her country vulnerable during a transition of power. But Judah was in special danger because tiglath pileser III had ascended the throne of Assyria a few years before in 745 BC and immediately went on the warpath, which made his nation an invincible superpower that threatened the independent existence of all nations in the Near East. In this time of crisis, God encouraged Isaiah by showing the prophet that he was still in control. And we talked about this a little bit. You were pointing out the idea, and it, and it brings it out here, the death of any absolute ruler. Right. Well, kings were absolute rulers. Why in the world would Israel, God's people, have chosen an absolute ruler? <laughs> well, so, why they did it, I don't know. But in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 7, it goes back to the history of this because it, it wasn't always the case that Israel had an earthly king. They had judges, they had prophets right. and whatnot, but God had been their sovereign. That was why he brought them to Mount Sinai, gave them his law, and said, you will be my people, I will right. be your God. But by the time you get to 1 Samuel chapter 8, uh, the, and we're not going to get into the history of all that, but basically the elders that said, said, look, we're done with this system without an earthly king. Look at all the other nations. They have a king. Right. We want that too. And God, I mean, in his infinite wisdom, does not destroy them for their insolence. He's like, right. all right, listen to what they're saying, give them, but warn them that this yeah, is what's going to happen. If that, And lo and behold, as we now read in Isaiah, all the chaos and that comes from looking to, well, and if you notice that every time a king comes up, the whole country takes on the personality and direction of the king, whether yes. it's a good one or a bad one. And here That's Uzziah true. was good, but then he was bad. Now he's dead. What do we do? And they'd lost sight of God himself as the sovereign, the king of kings, if you will. That's right. And so God evidently in Isaiah 6 takes this opportunity, this mm -hmm. leadership crisis, to redirect their attention. That's what it appears to, and I think that's what the lesson is bringing out. In fact, Sunday lesson... Well, that's lesson, how it even says it in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, comma, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. Right. You know, it's a clear contrast. Like They're focused on the death of Uzziah, but I was, my chitter was drawn to the living king on heaven's throne. That's right. And, and Sunday quarterly says, the king is dead, long live the king. Well, there's a little <laughs> play on words there. Exactly. Because let's get to looking at the real king. And so, yes, Isaiah sees the Lord sitting on a throne. That's not an accident. And he sees God in all his glory. What a contrast mm -hmm. that must have been from the earthly kings. 
Well, and that's even exactly, the best of Earthly Kings. That's exactly what was drawn out in uh, in Monday's lesson. She, yes. Uh, the quote there from Park uh, Prophets and Kings, page three hundred seven, uh, about two thirds of the way down the page. Fourth says, paragraph. As Isaiah beheld this revelation of the glory and majesty of his Lord, he was overwhelmed with a sense of the purity and holiness of God. How sharp the contrast between the matchless perfection of his creator and the sinful course of those who, with himself, had long been numbered among the chosen people of Israel and Judah. Mm -hmm. So you imagine he's looking at Uzziah, he's looking at his people, he's looking at these other kings threatening, he's looking at his own experience, and then he's shown God in his holiness, on his throne, and the the automatic response is his undoing. I am undone. Yes. Uh, it's it's we're, shocking. We're yeah. going to get to that under point number two. In point number one, um, the idea of putting don't not putting your trust in princes. I mean, everything you're saying, like once you see the Lord in His glory, why do you want another? Character? How small everything else, <laughs> right. insignificant. Like that's what we were. And so the for. Lord is trying to get them to see in the midst of all this crisis and uncertainty, you don't need to be worried. Mm. I'm on the throne. I'm in control, mm. and that, that, and we'll see the effect of that vision. But the first point there is, is not to put your trust. We should never put our trust in any earthly person. As much as we do look to, and we, there are right. people in, in positions mm. of authority, whether they be parents, or whether they be teachers, or whether they be right. uh, uh, leaders in the church, or leaders in sure. community or government. Yet. God is the ultimate authority right. and should be treated as such. So while God is a God of order, he's the one on the top of the hierarchy That's chart exactly. for sure. And that leads us into number two, God's glory is our motivation for mission. And the way this motivation works, um, it almost sounds a little bit too trite in, in the talking point because there's a process that happens here. Now you touched about the first one mm -hmm. uh, and I've got the bullet point here, beholding Christ. We talk about beholding Christ and when people talk about it today, mm -hmm. I, in the Adventist church, oh, you just need to behold Jesus. And almost, it's almost this, you get this ethereal, elated, um, oh, we're just going to behold Jesus. and It's like and an inch kind of, away from mysticism almost. It's like this. Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like you're going to have this warm, euphoric feeling, mm. but you don't find that ever in Scripture. When a person beholds the Lord, the first <laughs> thing that you just mentioned yeah. with Isaiah is he said, I am undone. And the word in the Hebrew means destroyed. Yeah. I'm destroyed, decimated, obliterated. Mm. I've just seen the Lord. I, I'm a man of unclean lips. Yeah. And I dwell in the midst of a people of it, and my eyes have seen the king in all his glory. Mm. You know, and yeah. so you think of Daniel who saw the Lord mm -hmm. and said, All my comeliness was turned in me into corruption. You mm. think of Peter on the boat with Jesus when he saw, he got a glimpse of the glory of Christ mm -hmm. in the catch of the fish, and he fell down at his <laughs> knees and he said, Whoa, uh, Lord, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man. Like, this is the reaction, the first reaction we see when somebody truly beholds Christ. Well, and I think about some of the commonness that we refer to deep religious things or some of the trite and flippant kind of like almost well i'm thinking of like some of the music and i'm not getting into a whole thing mm -hmm. about music but some of the 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 shallowness of the lyrics and the superficiality of the religious experience that's conveyed there yes. you know like oh, i'm gonna do this i'm gonna do that i'm gonna j jump before jesus dance before jesus, clap for jesus you know like that song <laughs> I, I can only imagine uh, what is going to be like am i going to dance am i going to no, <laughs> you're going to fall on your face as a dead man. That's what's going to happen. There isn't like, and, and we kind of lose sight of the holiness and splendor and glory and purity of God in our lower estimation when we need a re, we need to recalibrate our lives to his truth and his Well, we're going to flesh that out a little bit because what you said, like this is the problem that so many people have and it is a byproduct of cheap Christianity, mm. is that you say you're going to fall on your face as a dead man. I can imagine multitudes of Christians just being, re re that's <laughs> revolting yeah. what you said, like falling <laughs> on your face. You know, that makes it sound so miserable, yeah. Christianity. And, and what's happened is there are a lot of people who have never experienced the joy that comes mm. through being stricken. Yeah with humility at the presence of the Lord. I'm thinking about, and I told you about the late Pastor Tony Serigliano would told the same thing. He's talking about people who, they say, I don't need the Bible. I, I talk to the Lord and the Spirit leads me in. Mm -hmm. He was talking about a guy who said, you know, I was just talking to the Lord this morning while I was shaving. And he said, you, you were shaving? <laughs> And you just had this conversation with the Lord. He said, in the Bible, they fell on their faces, like, yeah. like you mentioned. So, well, we don't like that fall on your face because it's like, well, 
God doesn't want us to be afraid of him. God doesn't, yeah. and, and, and we agree with I that. I agree with that. And there is a joy that comes through that. But you mentioned yeah. the point that Isaiah is the messenger of the Lord himself. Right. Like of all people who, you can't say, well, he didn't have a relationship with Jesus, and that's right, why. Exactly. No, he had a relationship with Jesus, and yet, woe is me, he says, mm. for I am undone. And the point being that a view of the Lord's holiness results in humility and dependence, not a giddy elation. Mm. And in fact, we see this on Tuesday's lesson, Statements from Prophets and Kings, page 308, the second paragraph down, it says, Standing as it were in the full light of the divine presence within the inner sanctuary, he, Isaiah, realized that if left to his own imperfection and inefficiency, he would be utterly, utterly, sorry, utterly unable to accomplish the mission to which he had been called. So, interestingly, he first he has that personal... Yeah, there's a transition point there, yeah. There's a personal revelation of his own unworthiness, but then he realizes how inefficient and incapable he is, and what it does is it produces a level of dependency on the Lord that nothing else would have. And you would think that if I see the Lord and he's so much purer, so much holier, so much higher than I am, that that would be discouraging. And then he's gonna give you a mission that says, now go to the whole world and you realize you can't do it, that you would leave discouraged. You would leave yes. like uh, downtrodden, like, well, it's he's too holy, the mission's too big, I'm too small, I'm too dirty. And I think oftentimes people think that's what would happen if you emphasized right. our sinfulness or God's sinlessness. Yes. When the reality is there's something inspiring about the fact that, man, I can let go of any pretense to my own capacity because I'm not done. There's yeah. nothing in me. If this is going to get done, it's only through your glory. And let's you be know. clear. When we are undone, that was not a revelation to God. It was a mm. revelation to us. Wow. And so it's like, well, no, because we can't, because then we're going to feel, what? I'm going to feel different when I realize that God has, what God has known all along. Yeah. I, I, I think, and this is where, this is where the true um, uh, peace comes in Christianity to know that, wait a minute. The God who's calling me, who loves me, who's appealing to me, it's like, boy, if he finds this out, no, he already knew it. Mm. And he still called you and he still loved you. And he, you understand what I'm saying? And this is what we see in Isaiah's experience. Yeah. Um, the Lord addresses, when Isaiah says, woe is me, or I am undone, man, the Lord addresses it, the cry of impurity. And I have this in those, by touching his lips with a coal from the altar. And thus, in the, in the context, he says, purging his sins. Mm -hmm. So this... This impurity of Isaiah, the Lord says, I've made your sin pass from you. And the lesson makes a great point in the third paragraph on Tuesday that he touched the lips because lips signify not only speech, but also the entire person who utters it. Mm. You know, James says he can tame the tongue as a perfect man. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the Lord, through this symbolism, shows that despite the unworthiness of man, mm -hmm. he's willing to purge away all man's iniquity. And he does this for Isaiah, and it's this, now notice the steps right. that Here happen. This moves him to this, this volunteering. Well, the volunteering, yeah, yeah, let's bring that up because obviously the first part of his experience with the Lord is his own recognition of his unrighteousness and his undoing, right? Right. But then in verse 8 it says, I also, in addition to that yes. first part, heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. Now, it would be one thing if the Lord says, pick okay, yourself now, up. Go. I'm going to send you. You go. And he's like, well, I guess I have well, to. Well, and he said to Jeremiah, I've ordained you as a prophet right. of the nations. He could have just said, look, go. And so you, we kind of, I maybe read into this a little mm -hmm. something, but the Lord doesn't necessarily need Isaiah to go. He's looking for some, anybody. Yeah. And Isaiah, from his undone position, then speaks up and volunteers, Well, I Here think I you am. make a good point, too. He's, he's not looking for anybody. He's looking for somebody who's willing. Mm. He could have appointed anybody. So he, but the Lord knows that the effectiveness in ministry is not dependent on how much we know or think mm. we know or how, what our background and experience and all that is. It's our willingness to mm. go. <laughs> yes. And so rather than just order him to go, he makes that point. And why does Isaiah respond the way he does? Why is he so quick to respond? It was because of this process. Mm -hmm. this, this experience of beholding the Lord's glory and seeing his own personal sin led him to, how in the world is he going to experience the joy of forgiveness if he doesn't even see and acknowledge his personal sin? So mm -hmm. that, as much as we don't like it, and I was going to make this point, that in the book Steps to Christ, 
because again, once we talk about beholding Christ, another way we talk about it is, is mm -hmm. beholding the cross, mm -hmm. uplifting the cross. We hear that a lot today. Let's lift up the cross. The best chapter in Ellen White's writings you'll ever read on lifting up the cross and its effect is the chapter in, in uh, Steps to Christ called Repentance. Mm. You read Repentance chapter and it repeatedly talks about the effect of beholding Christ and it is just that effect to see the first thing is to see our own unworthiness, but it's that which draws us to the Lord. Right. As the one who, and this is what we see in Isaiah's experience, and then the Lord freely cleanses, touches the lips with a coal from the altar, purifies him, and what is Isaiah's response? Lord, here I am, send me. Right. He can't stay quiet. He can't sit still now. He's got to go for the Lord. Well, it's parallel, and we have this in the notes too from uh, the experience in Psalm 51 of David and his repentance, yes. right? He says, restore to me the joy of salvation. He has this like, yes. he had to have that Nathan the prophet, thou art yes. the man, that, that crushing realization. He goes to the Lord. But as a result of that healing, that spiritual yes. renewal, he says, then I will teach transgressors your ways. You've got something to say now and you can't shut it up. You know, this reminds me of Ellen White quote. Uh, this is from Desire of Ages 195. Every true disciple is born into the kingdom of God as a missionary. That's right. That if you have a true following of Jesus experience, that true conversion, it is not like, it, it's almost not optional for you. Not that he's making you do it, but it's coming from right. your bones right now. I got to get out and tell this. And right. so it seems to be this is when the opportunity is given, who will go for us? Isaiah's right there like, me, 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 let me go. He's eager for it. So I put in the notes here, and it's actually not in our notes. I, I should add it in. I jotted it in is that humbling and because counterintuitive as it is, mm -hmm. humbling and purification is what produce joy. Mm. That humbling, the joy of salvation that David talks about, the joy in, in Isaiah's experience came through that humbling experience that he started with by seeing his own sinfulness and his need for the Lord because it kept him dependent. And when we're dependent, we're closer to the Lord. And the closer we are to the Lord, the more we experience that joy. Mm -hmm. uh, Ellen White makes the point in Prophets and Kings, page 310, that this assurance that God gives him through this experience of this vision, this assurance of the final fulfillment of God's purpose brought courage to the heart of Isaiah. What though earthly powers array themselves against Judah? What though the Lord's messenger meet with opposition and resistance? Like who cares? Mm -hmm. All the earthly powers can come against me. All the opposition. Isaiah had seen the king, the Lord of hosts, he had heard the song of the seraphim. The whole earth is full of his glory. He had the promise that the messages of Jehovah to backsliding Judah would be accompanied by the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, and the prophet was nerved for the work before him. I love that phrase. The prophet was nerved. You know, so before this, like, he might have been even timid. He might have been a little scary. But after this That's experience, right. he's like, Sit me, let me at him. That's Let's right. do this. Nerve to the work. So God's glory is a motivation for mission. Mm -hmm. But it's that, that entire ex process, that experience we have, beholding the glory of God and what it does to us. And that leads us into the third point that, that uh, the lesson addresses. Because after this um, encounter, Isaiah sees the Lord. Who will go for me? Who will go for us, rather? Here I am, Lord, send me. Then the Lord says, okay, here's what I want you to go and say. And this is picking up from Thursday's lesson. In verse 9, it says, chapter 6, verse 9 of Isaiah, he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but don't understand. Keep on seeing, but don't perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their ears, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he said, until the cities are laid waste without inhabitant, the houses are without a man, the land is utterly desolate. Uh, the Lord has removed men far away, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, and that's what the lesson calls it is the appalling appeal. Yeah, it like, what like, kind of appeal is this? send this message of hope. It's like, oh, you're all going to be, it's miserable, right? But it's, what you have to read into this and understand is, like, for example, verse 10, make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy. How in the world is Isaiah supposed to make the heart? Like, we always talk about how we can't change a person's heart. So how is he going to make their heart dull? Mm. Well, the, the, what the Lord is trying to tell Isaiah, he's trying to prepare him for the consequences of him giving his mm. message. The hearts are going to become, he's going to make the hearts dull by preaching the message of truth. And what the Lord's speaking to, and the lesson brings this out, is the, 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 the effect of rejecting the Spirit of God mm. and his appeals. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a choice that we make. Uh, and so what we put as point number three is grieving the Spirit, the unpardonable sin, whatever you want to mm -hmm. call it, 
is our choice, not God's. It's not God who says, you know what, fine, I'm going to make them so they can't hear. No, right. he's going to give the message, but the le well, the lesson brings this out uh, this way on Thursday. In fact, why don't you read the first couple paragraphs on Thursday, and I think it just really uh, makes this point sure. plain. Uh, lest we think that Isaiah heard wrong or that this passage is unimportant, Jesus cited this passage to explain why he taught in parables. Now, pause right there for a second, <laughs> yeah. but that's a really interesting point because mm -hmm. this is a direct quote that Jesus inferred when he was teaching hard-hearted people too. That's right. Because this is what he understood to be true. God does not want any to perish. That's 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, which explains why he sent Isaiah to the people of Judah and Jesus to the world. God's desire is not to destroy, but to save eternally. But while some people respond positively to his appeals, others become firmer in their resistance. Nevertheless, God keeps on appealing to them in order to give them more and more opportunities to repent. Yet the more they resist, the harder they become. So in that sense, what God does to them results in the hardening of their hearts, even though he would rather that these actions soften them. God's love toward us is unchanging, our individual response to his love is the crucial variable. What an excellent and, 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 and later on it goes into talks about the, the, probably the most famous example of hardening the heart is yes. the, say, uh, Moses speaking to Pharaoh, Pharaoh right? Mm -hmm. And ph Pharaoh has because the opportunity. Because the Lord outright says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Right. Well, but and he also says, brings out nine times he says he's going to harden his heart. And other times he says, he is his Pharaoh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh hardened. hardened his heart. So yes. which is it? And the answer is yes. The Lord desired to see God's people let go, and Pharaoh is more than welcome to be part of that letting go right. process, to co be co-labor with him in this, right? But God's purpose was going to get done, and giving that message plainly now puts the onus on Pharaoh to make a decision. Are you going to be with me in this, or are you going to be against me in this? And so when the Lord hardens his heart, it's not through a miraculous like uh, decree, a I'd say even a Calvinistic, like, I've determined right. you are lost. It's predestination. No, 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 no. He's giving him the opportunity, but he knows the end from the beginning, right. saying this is what's going to result. And sure enough, that's what happened. But my people are still going to go. Well, I, I'm going to ask you a question, maybe a sensitive question as a pastor. Have you ever known, uh, let me put it this way. In my ministry, there are times when I skip, like I knew there was something I had to say very plainly. But I had to bide my time on when to say it because I knew that as soon as I did, some people would just plain dig their heels in. Mm. As much as what I said was right and needed mm. to be said, I think about that in the term of when it's saying here that, you know, this is, Jesus quoted this as the reason why he spoke in parables. In other words, he spoke in parables and he couched certain things. You know, there came a point in his ministry where the disciples says, now you're speaking plainly. Mm. Where, mm. where he couched it so as... To try not to, to get the best stir opportunity, up the, yeah, 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 because there comes a time. So I think it's it's important for those sharing mm. a message to to try not to get the ire of people up. Although there comes a time when you have well, to speak you plainly. Back, yeah. But but I also I want to do the flip side of that and say the other point is we as individuals need it. You know, some people may be hearing what I'm saying and say, "Yeah, the pastor doesn't always have to point it out so plain." Now wait a minute, <laughs> we. The bottom line is here, it, here is that grieving the Spirit is our choice. And it doesn't matter how the pastor or anybody says it. People might say something wrong. We might perceive it as wrong. But the way we take it is our choice. Right. And if it's true and right, we need to follow it. Well, and you've got to remember this in, in the context of Isaiah, who the yes. Lord said, cry aloud, That's spare right. not, right? But his go goal in that, again, is not punitive. It's not just to, just to punish and to reveal the wrath of God. Is like, I'm crying aloud and sparing. I'm going to give you the whole truth so that you can make a choice, so that you can yes. repent. That's the goal is always repentance, right? Right. And I love uh, Albert Barnes' commentary on, uh, this is on Ephesians 4.30, where the apostle says not to grieve the Holy Spirit. He makes the point that all that is needful for a Christian to do in order to be eminent in piety is to yield to the gentle influences which would draw him to prayer and to heaven. The Holy Spirit is always wooing and appealing. We need to not fight him. Mm. And Isaiah was the voice of God speaking to his people. It was the Holy Spirit speaking to his people. And the Lord is speaking to us today through his word and through his prophet. And we need to be careful not to reject that message or those mm. messages any more than 
the people were in Isaiah's day to reject his message. That's absolutely true. Well, there's the concluding statement that if you're studying this in a small group setting, I would encourage you to read that Friday's uh, summary paragraph there. Yes. It says, at a time of insecurity, when the weakness of human leadership was painfully obvious, Isaiah was given a grand vision of the supreme leader of the universe. Petrified by inadequacy, but purified and empowered by mercy, Isaiah was ready to go forth as God's ambassador into a hostile world. Mm -hmm. And if you can't find an application to that today, we're just not looking right yeah, because the right. Lord has the same message for us and it would be... Uh, to our detriment to ignore it and we need to be yes. about God's business. So can you give us a word of closing prayer today? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we are so thankful uh, for the messages you have given throughout history, Lord, that speak to us still in these last days. We thank you for the messages of the prophet Isaiah and yet, Lord, they they sometimes um, find conflict in our hearts and re in resistance in our hearts as they did to people in Isaiah's day. I just pray you would give us soft hearts and willing hearts, obedient hearts, a willingness to, to yield to you and follow where you lead. Bless us to this end, Lord, for we ask and pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.